Writing Out Loud, a program designed to explore in-depth interviews with writers to hear that words have voices. Our hostess for today's program is Teresa Miller, Executive Director for the Oklahoma Center for Poets and Writers at OSU Tulsa. Hello everyone, I'm Teresa Miller and welcome to Writing Out Loud. My very super special guest is the one and only Billy Letts. Thank you, Billy, for being here. Teresa, I would never pass up a chance to be with you. I know it, and here we are on the air, and we're getting to share this with all of your many fans out there. You know when I go to Google and I Google Billy Letts, I mean, there are so many hits. Billy Letts, Billy Letts, Billy Letts, and most of them have the word Oprah in them too. Was that day when you and Oprah sealed the deal over the telephone or however you did it, did, was that day one of those days that changed your life forever? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I had said to my husband after that, I really don't want my life to change. I was content with it as it was, but it changed it dramatically. Suddenly I was uh, invited for speaking engagements, <laughs> uh, travel. I, I I've been to most of the states now as a result of that, and uh, a little more celebrity than I was prepared for. Not that people recognize me or uh, come up in a crowd and ask for my autograph. Not that I've that seen them do just that, Billy. You're too well. Honest. A few times. A few times. Well, you know, millions of readers took Nova Lee and her, her friends into their lives. And, and I wonder, as you look back at the, those wonderful characters now, what, 13 years later, do you yeah. see them and their story any differently? You know, I've been thinking about America, uh, who is seven years old at the end of the book. Yeah. And I'm thinking she would be a good age now for a character. So for all those readers who said, will you write a sequel? And I said, I don't think so. I want them to know I'm rethinking that. I, I very well might give it a shot, see how it goes. Well, you know, the other day I was watching a, a DVD of The Other Boleyn Girl, which stars Natalie Portman, mm -hmm. and of course she also played Nova Lee in the movie version Where the Heart Is. And my first reaction was not there's Natalie Portman. I thought, there's Nova Lee. <laughs> Nova Lee. <laughs> yeah, and I wondered if any of the performances in that film left lasting impressions with you. Oh, sure. Mostly I was so surprised because the people who were cast in the movie were nothing like the characters in my head, mm -hmm. uh, especially Sister Husband. She was so different on screen from the Sister Husband I yeah. had written. Ashley Judd, this gorgeous, glamorous actress, was nothing like my Lexi Coop. I think probably Natalie Portman was closer to the, to the character I saw as I wrote the book, but they're still in my head. They'll be there from now on. Well, they're a part of you. That's what made them such great characters is, is they weren't just characters to you. They're, they're real people. And I felt, feel very protective of Nova Lee. I did from page one of that book because I knew I was going to put her through such tough times, and I, I, felt, I felt bad about that. Uh, so I had to bring her out on the other side in a much better situation. But... Yeah, she's still with me, and mm -hmm. I still feel protective of her, very motherly. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it sounds so exciting, I mean, being on Oprah. I bet you and Oprah go shopping together all the time. We're you just her, like this. Yeah. We you, talk every day. You give her advice about <laughs> Stedman and the latest dieting craze. Oh, yeah. All that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And then the movie premieres. But we got to, you, you hinted at this just a moment earlier, that there have got to be some pressures, some special pressures that come with all that notoriety. And I know you're very, very grateful for your success. Do you think the fact that you were a little older when all this success came has made it easier for you to keep it in perspective? I do. I do. If all of this had happened to me when I was young, 25, 30, I, I think I would have been uh, so full of myself that I would have been unbearable. Well, you know, the thing that everybody always says to me is that Billy is just like the rest of us. And, of course, you're, you're, you're more than the rest of us. We know that you have this special gift. But, but you don't seem to be terribly affected by your success. Oh, I hope not. That, that would hurt me, really, if people came away with that impression of me. Your second novel, Honk and Holler, opening scene, I love, love that book. But it's in a very different kind of setting 
from where the heart is. And where the heart is, we, we have this, you know, Walmart and the chain store mentality. And then what we have in, you know, Honk and Holler is we have this back roads uh, diner. Not many people coming in and out. They're struggling. Where would we be more likely to find you, Billy, eating chicken fried steak at this diner or standing in line at Walmart? Chicken fried steak. <laughs> Absolutely. If the gravy's good, I'd be there often. <laughs> You've made no secret about the fact that it was hard for you to write Honk and Holler. It was hard for you to write your next book, Shoot the Moon. What do you think about writing? it is about writing that makes it hard for you? Well, it's especially the deadline. I had no deadline when I wrote Where the Heart Is. I, I didn't, the book was not sold. It was just written from uh, on spec. And with the others, I've had a deadline. And that creates a lot of pressure because... Life does kick you in the behind from time to time, right. and you have to deal with that while the the deadline grows closer and closer. I think that's why I've had so much trouble, and I made the deadline until this last book, and I was terribly late with it. Well, do you think sometimes, though, Billy, that the struggles make you a better writer? Well, because I, it seems I think to me so. It seems to me that each of your books is getting better, and I just wonder if, this, if you're learning things in the struggle. Well, I'm learning about the hardships that life throws my way, so maybe that does have something to do with the tone of the books. I think they get a little darker each time, though um, I can't really explain that. It might just be my aging and seeing more of what life does to people. Sometimes it can be very cruel, very unforgiving. You know, in fact, uh, some critics called your novel Shoot the Moon a mystery. Do you think of it as a mystery at all? I don't. There is a, a mystery in the book, but I don't call the book a mystery. And I have no respect for mystery writers because I included that in, in my book. Uh, putting down clues, a red herring here and there, and then trying to tie it all up. Uh, the mystery and the the story, the the plot line of the story, it was difficult for me. Mm. Would you agree with what Mark Twain once said, and he, he talked a lot about moons too, that symbol that you use in the novel, that people are like moons, we all have dark sides. Oh, certainly, certainly. I think we're as capable of evil as we are of good. And so I guess that's the mystery, this human mystery that we find in your work, Shoot the Moon and your other novels. Your new book, Made in the USA, you say that you were a little bit late with it, but boy, when it came out, it got a starred review in Publishers Weekly. I was I was proud of that, but there was a New York, uh, <laughs> there was a New York uh, uh, writer who said that I treated my characters inhumanely in that in that book. Well, that's just not true, Billy. And when you get a review like that, what's your reaction to it? Well, I follow my son's advice, Tracy. He says if you believe the good reviews, then you have to believe the bad reviews. Well, it seems to me that starred review trumps just about everything. In Made in the USA, you return to Walmart, albeit briefly, and I'm wondering if I could get you to read this little section from your opening chapter. Certainly. I'd be glad to. I'll set this up by telling you that uh, uh, two young people, brother and sister, she's 15, Ludi is 15, and her brother, Fate, is 11, and they live with a woman named Floyd Satterfield, who is not the mother. Their mother died when they were quite young. She's not the stepmother because she never married their father who's left them. Uh, and she's not a foster parent just out of the goodness of her heart. Mm -hmm. She kept these two kids after the father left. And this takes place in Walmart where Floyd has just uh, uh, lost consciousness mm -hmm. at the checkout line. She had pitched sideways when she fell, slamming into racks of batteries, disposable lighters, TV guides, and candy, spilling them onto the floor beside her. Her head was twisted at an angle that would have been painful had she been able to feel pain, and her glasses had slipped onto her cheeks. Her mouth was pulled into a perfect O as if she had been about to whistle, and bits of the tums she had been chewing clung to her bottom lip. 
Her fingers, adorned with rhinestone rings, still clutched the National Enquirer she had just paid for. The policeman knelt beside her still body and dipped his fingers into the folds of flesh around her neck, probing for a pulse. Then he bent over and put his cheek next to her open mouth. Moments later, he straightened, pretending not to notice the urine seeping through the crotch of Floyd's blue polyester pants and puddling beneath her buttocks. He stood and faced the checker behind the register. You know who she is, he asked. The checker shook her head. I seen her in here before, though. Then he turned to the crowd around him. Do any of you know this woman? Those gathered craned their necks and waited. Is anyone here with this woman, he yelled. Then softly, her voice hardly more than a whisper, Ludie said, I am. Such a beautiful passage. I, that passes the jealousy test. I sure wish I'd written that. Oh, I feel like that often when I'm reading other authors. And, of course, Ludi. Ludi is the one who says, I am. And But nobody's with her. No. You know, nobody's with her, and she's she, watching out for her, her young brother, Fate. How did you get to know these young children so well? Well, I have three pretend granddaughters, <laughs> uh, Hispanic sisters, and uh, I've been involved with them for a number of years, especially now the, the youngest one who is 16. And I learn from them a lot about young girls being lonely, uh, being uh, shipped from one foster home to another. And Ludi is terrified of foster care. So that's why she comes up with the idea that she and Fate should go to Las Vegas and try to find their father. In fact, you and your husband, Dennis, actually went to Las Vegas just on a, you've been for fun a lot of times, but you actually went just on a research mission. We did. We got a driver to take us to the seediest parts of the city, uh, parts that tourists never see, and we visited uh, soup kitchens and homeless shelters, the library where Fate spends a lot of his time. We went in shops that sell costumes to uh, the exotic dancers who work in the, in the casinos. Uh, we went to pawn shops, uh, adult bookstores, uh, porno shops, trying to see how two kids would live in a car in Las Vegas and what they would encounter in the parts of the cities where they had to park the car. You know, as a writer, Billy, you could have made things prettier for these kids, but you didn't. I wanted to. I know, you had I, to fight that. I, I cried at times when I put them through some terrible experiences. Uh, I knew where I was going with this book. I knew how it was going to end. I just didn't know exactly how I was going to get there, and I love those surprises in writing. I think that's what keeps me at it. So it's a discovery process for you. Absolutely, absolutely. Figuratively speaking, how did you get the kids from, from Las Vegas to Hugo, Oklahoma, this wonderful circus town? Because we're not talking just about a change of venue for them. It's a whole change in life perspective. It is, and it's, it's not a, a running away to the circus story no. either. Uh, at the darkest of times in Las Vegas, they are befriended by a man who has a history with the circus family in Hugo. Uh, you probably know that Hugo is the wintering quarters for three to five circuses now and has been for many, many years. And he whisked this, these young people out of Las Vegas to Oklahoma where he has some uh, resentments hanging mm -hmm. from past experience, but to a safer place for these children and introduces them to the circus life. 
circus becomes a great metaphor because it's a really extended family, which is your ongoing theme. And, you know, people are misfits and all, but they, they come together uh, in, in, under the big top, uh, so to speak, big top of, of life. As you talk about this man earlier, as you were reading about Floyd, what's clear to me is there is no such thing as a minor character in a Billy Letts novel. You have characters that don't take up as many pages and don't figure as prominently in the plots, but we still get little glimpses of them and get to know them very well in short periods of time. Is that important to you as a writer? It's terribly important. Um, just think of your day yesterday or your days last week, the people you came in contact with and those that you had some conversation with and the part they played in how your day turned out is not just the people who are the main people in your life but those that you encounter just going through daily routines they're important to mm -hmm. us well you know it's impossible to to read this book and not come away with a strong strong affection for these two children and their extended family that they find and also the, the sense of the aloneness that affects them, but not only affects them, but, but, but lots of people. Billy, were there any important social concerns that you wanted to raise with this book? I mean, it, points that you wanted to make. It's a great story, but were there some important social commentaries that, that you wanted to make? Yes. It's, uh, I wanted to write a page turner. What author sure. does it? Absolutely, and it is that. Uh, I wanted to write an entertaining story, but... At the end, I wanted readers to come away thinking about throwaway kids in this society. I discovered in some of my research that over 800,000 children a year go missing. It's startling, isn't it? it it's just unbelievable. And almost 2,000 a year, children die from abuse, neglect, and murder. That's in our country. That's in mm -hmm. the USA, which is why I came up with the title, Made in the USA. Unfortunately, we do have the reality of these children with us all the time. When you write a story like this, when you get this close to characters who are having such a hard time, I mean, Nova Lee had a hard time, but not like this. No. This, this is harder. This is edgier. Does it change you, too? Well, uh, I went through periods of deep depression when I was writing the book and I seldom read when I'm uh, on a speaking engagement I seldom read from those much much darker sections of the book because it upsets me so much uh, I'm reminded of a trip Dennis and I took we played a I was playing the book on tape for where the heart is and after so many of the cassettes went in. I had to turn it off because I was crying. Dennis said, what's wrong? And I said, oh, they're just in such terrible <laughs> shape. And he said, well, hell, you put them there. <laughs> well, I've got to tell you, you played a, a real dirty trick on me when I was reading Made in the USA, and I was really concerned about one of the characters, and I don't want to give the plot away. And you told me something bad happened to that character that didn't happen. And I was just reading that book in anticipation all the time. And That's some of my weird humor, Teresa. Well, you know that. Well, but you know what? It turned out great because I was so relieved that it didn't <laughs> happen. And I thought, oh, thank goodness. I feel like we've all been spared. You were actually doing the, the finishing touches to this book when your son Tracy's play, August Osage County, opened in Chicago, then went on to New York. At that time, you also learned your husband, Dennis, who was in the play, was, was seriously ill. So it was a time of great highs and lows. Did having that play as a framework, having your book as a backdrop, did all of that help you with those kinds of painful transitions in a way? Oh, I don't know if they helped. There were days when uh, that, that would occupy my mind from time to time, and that was a relief from, from grief, even though it was temporary but I took such pleasure in Tracy's success that Absolutely. It, it meant a lot to me and in Dennis's success and Dennis and it got to be on Broadway which for him was just the icing on the cake he said I've done everything I wanted to do now and that's right how did you hear that Tracy won the Pulitzer Prize he called. I knew the day they were going to announce it, and I had the television on. I thought there'd be an announcement on television. I, I didn't hear one, 
and the phone rang and I said hello and it was Tracy and, he, and it, it, there was a pause and he said well I won so low key and I'm jumping around screaming you won you won the Pulitzer and he's very quiet very very quiet very said, humble guy isn't yes he? he is and he said I just wish dad were here to to know this and I said ah he knows it yeah, he does he knows it he's smiling right now with tears rolling down his face and he was with you again at the Tony Awards what oh yeah great time Billy I was watching on TV and I just saw the biggest smile on your face when when it was announced that Tracy's play was the outstanding uh, drama oh it was, it was be just such a moment and Sean uh, my older son was sitting beside me and the moment Tracy came out of the announcer's mouth. Sean was on his feet, and he was crying and applauding. And I think I was the second on my feet, and then of course the whole, the entire audience stood to applaud him. But it was it was one of those moments that you just never get too far from. What do mother and son writers say to to each other at times like that? Oh, sort of a double bond. Not only are you mother and, and son, but you also, you know, both writers. Beyond congratulations, uh, we just thank each other for telling the truth in our writing, for not backing away from anything. Tracy told the truth on stage of of my family, <laughs> my parents, and he asked me how I felt about it, and I said, "You told the truth." That's what's important. Don't don't back away from that. Were you a little bit uneasy about it at first? When you I first was. I was, Teresa. Because I know when you were going to Chicago, and we talked about it a little bit, because like, you didn't know quite what to expect. No, I had read a draft of the play, but I also knew it had changed a great deal from the first draft. So there could be some surprises for me in it. And there were a few, actually. But he did a good job. I did say to him uh, at some point, I think you were quite kind to my mother. <laughs> and for those who've seen the play or have read the play, they'll know the irony in that remark. When you read Tracy's plays, he's he's since written Superior Donuts. Before that, he the man man from uh, Nebraska and uh, all these wonderful plays that he's done. Does it ever surprise you? I mean, you you knew him as a little boy and as he he grew sure. up and everything. Does it you read this and think I can't believe Tracy wrote this? I I do feel that way at times, and and something will flash in my memory of Tracy, uh, something that happened when he was six or nine or 17 and I think this is that kid who wrote this this is my boy who wrote this what a surprise what a delightful amazing surprise it is do writing genes just run in your family I don't know about that uh, Dennis was a wonderful writer he said he lacked the self-discipline to stick with it but he wrote a lot of non-fiction especially political uh, pieces. He was also a great critic. He was a wonderful critic, a tough critic. Could be very tough on his wife at times. <laughs> but, but your biggest supporter too. Oh yes, he was my greatest fan. When we, when you become as involved as as you became with Made in the USA, is it hard to let that book go? Is it hard to let Ludie go? Is it harder to let them go than say it was no belief? It's hard to let all of them go. Teresa. Really? Is it? it really is. Uh, and of course, like all writers, I have some regrets after a book is published. Really? Yeah, Even with I'm, all your success, Billy, because you really, you know, you've hit the tops of the bestseller list and all that. You still have regrets? Oh, sure. I'll, I'll read a section and I'll think, I could have done a better job with that. Or I read a page and I think, you know, a lot of this I could have just deleted. I should have just edited it a little more carefully. But I don't dwell on that. I can't dwell on that because those nasty little voices start speaking at the back of my head when I'm writing saying, you can do better than this. Do you really think that your readers are going to like this book? So I try not to dwell on, on those tougher times. You also do screenplays. I have done a number of screenplays uh, 
And people tell me my writing is visual, and I credit that with having worked with screenplays for I, a number of years. I wondered about that, but unlike Tracy, you've never been involved with acting. Is that right? Oh, I'm terrible. I'm terrible. I did a couple of community theater plays, one uh, called Tribute because Dennis played the role of my ex-husband, <laughs> and Tracy played our son. So it was fun for the three of us, but I, I am so wooden on stage. The director was trying to help me cry on stage, and she kept saying, think about something so sad in your life that you just can't hold the tears back. I couldn't do it, and finally she said, just cover your eyes with a Kleenex then and make crying sounds. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get back to this big news bombshell you dropped at the early part of the interview about this sequel maybe sequel to Where the Heart Is. Are yeah. you really serious that that's going to maybe going to happen fairly soon? I'm going to give it a shot. I oh, am. That's exciting. I'm going to start uh, Monday, and I'm going to try to write in first person. I've never done that before because I'm afraid of all the eyes. I think this, and I see this, and I that that bothers me. So I'm reading fiction right now written in the first person to see how other writers handle it. Not that I haven't paid attention before, but now sure. it's more important to me. Sure. Does it spook you to think about, you know, telling us who the, the narrator is going to be? It does. In okay. A way. Okay. I won't ask you then. But if it doesn't work out, I'll know it by the end of second, third chapter, and then I'll go back and rewrite in third person. I don't guess there's any way, Billy. See, I grew up watching soap operas that you can bring sister husband back. I know she was supposedly <laughs> killed in a tornado, but can't we say that maybe that was somebody else and that she's just been off, you know, in Buffalo or somewhere leading a double life and that she'll be back any chance we can bring her back? You know back. who you sound like? Who? Dennis Letts. Well, I take that as just about the nicest compliment. After that? After that book came out, he said, now in your second book, why don't you go back and set it at an earlier time? Do a prequel? Yes, a prequel, so that we can see Sister Husband again. He said, I just don't want to lose her. Well, maybe you'll bring her back. If anybody can, you can. Billy, congratulations on Made in the USA and all the wonderful things in your career. And thank all of you so much for joining us on Writing Out Loud.